And so I will not be presenting um, a database of my own or a catalogue of my own. Uh, I would like to share a few thoughts uh, which have occurred to me over the past 15 years in the course of uh, collaborating with uh, a website called Ministre, which some of you might know about, I hope. Um, I've been in charge uh, ever since 19, 1997 Thank you. of um, the part of Ministre that deals with paleography in general and digitised manuscripts and archives. Um, when we started out, there was very little on the subject, and the early developments tended to split into two different kinds of projects. Um, on the first hand, catalogues uh, with descriptions but no pictures, so traditional catalogues, and photographs separated from catalogues, used as, well, showcases for libraries, virtual exhibitions, uh, and so on. So I would like to um, focus today precisely on the relationship between um, descriptions and reproductions in uh, our access to knowledge about manuscripts. The um, function of descriptions may be considered twofold. Uh, first of all, descriptions give access to information on something you can't see, but something you may want to see once you've read the description. Um, it, descriptions also provide information uh, that is not immediately apparent even when you do see the thing itself, because not everything useful meets the eye. Um, And yes, the information that doesn't meet, meet the eye um, may be more or less hidden in the manuscript itself. It might require special expertise, um, a critical study of the material, or information uh, gathered elsewhere. Pictures, on the other hand, uh, have different but complementary uses. They give information that goes beyond what can be formalised in a description. Uh, such as, uh, of course, measurements, uh, choir structure, uh, nomenclature of scripts and so on, plus information regarding illumination, of course, which no uh, description will ever describe completely. Uh, still, it should be stressed that seeing a picture is not the same, of course, as seeing the original. The picture is in two dimensions. Uh, it has it poses problems of scale, and often you don't actually know what the scale is of what you're seeing. Um, it poses problems of colour, because it is very difficult to judge uh, the colour of the original from what you actually see on the photograph. Uh, as good as this photograph might be, problems of texture, of course, some information. There is information in the texture of parchment itself. Um, there was a rather interesting paper by Elaine Trehan uh, at a recent colloquium in, in London uh, with the DigiPal project about what she called the hapticity of the manuscript. The manuscript as a physical object as opposed to anything we can uh, retrieve from, from two-dimensional documents. So pictures and descriptions offer different modes of knowledge uh, which also work on different scales. Of course, a description might be long or short, uh, but a reproduction also uh, might give just a general impression. That was often the case in early developments. I mean small-scale pictures, which give you an idea of the layout, might uh, make it possible to see something of the illumination, but very little about scripts uh, with text the texts that were usually actually not readable on screen. Um, and even, uh, of course, when the scale is one-to-one, -one, uh, as I said, the substitute, the reproduction, is not the thing itself, as we all know since uh, Borges, uh, Jorge Luis Borges wrote his 
story of the map in one-to-one -one scale. The map is not the land that is described on the map. Ideally, we should be able to combine uh, pictures and descriptions to make them work together. This has been proposed and attempted uh, on paper by uh, Peter Humbert in uh, this, which he calls an illustrated inventory of medieval manuscripts, uh, which gives very short descriptions, text descriptions in a highly formalized uh, form, together with pictures which at a glance might tell you much more, as long as you have some experience in dealing with manuscripts. This is mainly aimed at people interested in scripts, but not only. You might gather uh, other kinds of information, even from these tiny scraps of uh, photographs. Bringing together descriptions and pictures has been a great problem uh, from the outset. Of course, photographic coverage of collections needed and still needs to catch up with the quantity of information uh, available in textual descriptions of manuscripts. <coughs> If Uwehau uh, a few minutes ago said that about 50% of manuscripts of which we do have descriptions. Um, and in the earliest developments of, um, well, on the internet, um, some of the earliest developments dealt mainly with uh, illuminations. We have these two French projects, um, well, two French websites, Enluminure and uh, Liber Floridus by the uh, IRHT, the, uh, another project was on, the, uh, on Dutch illustrated manuscripts. And over the past 15 years, um, catalogues and digital uh, facsimiles have been moving ever closer together. But still, there are a number of problems to be solved. Catalogues still deal uh, primarily, of course, with texts. Material information, uh, is generally considered secondary, not necessarily in quantity, there might be plenty of it, but in the way it is presented and in the ways it might be used. The first problem is a uh, problem of searchability. Whoops. No. Um, I will not go back to problems of lack of standardisation, plenty has been said already by IF and others. Um, this was also a problem before uh, we ever thought of the internet, uh, even such a project as the Catalogue des Manuscrits Datés, the Catalogues of Dated Manuscripts, which dealt primarily with visual and material information, uh, but were devised at first um, for the study of scripts, um, was seen as problematic as soon as someone tried to extract quantitative codicological information from these uh, volumes. And the whole series, or the well, there are a number of series, of, as you know, uh, national series. The whole uh, has been described by Marilena Magnacci and Ezio Ornato as a codicological babel. This uh, whole program, the Catalogue de Mons was launched, as you probably know, in the 1950s, that was long before the web came up. Um, but, uh, so quantitative code ecology uh, was the first, uh, the first problem for that, uh, using that kind of uh, documentation. Even, um, well, coming to the, to the internet, even when the information is available, it is often non-searchable. This is the case, for instance, um, on Manuscripta Medievalia, where it is non-searchable in a formal way. It is searchable only in full texts, uh, in full text search inside um, discursive descriptions. And uh, I was very much impressed by what we saw yesterday with Stefano Zamponi, by the Manuscritti Datati d'Italia, which to my knowledge is um, the only online catalogue where such you know, features are actually searchable, formally searchable. Well, I must say this, uh, well this is always what is nice about this kind of meeting, you learn about things you should have known about long ago. And strangely enough, this, uh, well, everybody knows about the printed series, but I don't think the online version of Manuscritti Datati d'Italia is as well known as it should be, even among paleographers. The second problem is, once again, interoperability. 
this is a very severe problem. Uh, it stems, I think, from long-standing traditions in the way libraries and archives have always worked. They've always had their peculiar ways, as we know, uh, their own procedures, white gloves, no white gloves, uh, their own standards. And common standards have come into being, well, have been around for a long time for uh, printed books, but uh, we might not say the same about manuscripts. So you always needed to learn how to use every single repository to learn your way about. Uh, the World Wide Web, uh, paradoxically, has made things uh, even more complex, it seems to me. Each site, each website, has its own specific architecture. You need to learn your way about the site. Uh, you sometimes need special authorizations to see this or that. You have different technical standards uh, and often rather irritating technical gadgets too, especially in uh, digital manuscripts with things like turning the pages and so on, which are a terrible <laughs> pain. Um, which pose a problem of who these <coughs> things are made for. Are they for the general public or for scholars? The opportunity to build anything common on a grand scale, common gateways to source material, um, was initially lost, especially by many uh, major national institutions. Um, in some cases, manuscripts were mixed up with other kinds of material, uh, which posed other problems for the specific necessities of the description of manuscripts. This was the, this was the case, among others, uh, of the uh, Bibliothèque Nationale de France. You still have a few weird fields uh, in Gallica, where you have uh, something like a publication date for a Carolingian manuscript. So information based mainly on, printed, uh, on the formats developed for printed books. Um, it is interesting uh, that when global gateways uh, began to emerge uh, on a national scale, the German program, Manuscripta Medievalia, e Codices in Switzerland, Digital Scriptorium in the States, it is interesting to note uh, that these came mainly from countries with a federal tradition. Whereas uh, countries with a strong centralised national tradition, such as France, curiously enough, cannot get to work together quite as efficiently. There have been partial remedies uh, devised, uh, such as meta search engines. We have uh, heard about UCLA, a catalogue of, digi of uh, digital medieval man uh, digitised, sorry, uh, medieval manuscripts, and CERL, which goes beyond those manuscripts that have been digitised. In these cases, as has been uh, said, we uh, may search only uh, for basic information, author, date, etc., but not much on the material side of things. At least these uh, meta-search engines are remarkably user-friendly, uh, especially UCLA. It is often easier to find a manuscript through UCLA than going to the actual site where the manuscript has been uh, published. At least you don't need to figure out how to get to the pictures, from the catalogue to the pictures. Once again, and I won't go into this again, uh, the problem is one of standards, including different languages, which leads us once again to the question of authority lists, multilingual vocabularies, vocabularies etc. Uh, we do have two basic documents which might help. One, well, they've also been uh, mentioned, one is uh, Denis Museret's Chemicological Vocabulary, especially the online uh, quadrilingual, I think, uh, version. Um, and for scripts, especially late medieval scripts, uh, we've had for almost 10 years uh, Albert de Rollet's book on the panography of uh, Gothic books, which is arguable, arguable but reasonable and usable. Uh, there are certainly other solutions, and I hope we will be told more today and tomorrow about things like ontologies, the semantic web, and so on, and what those can give us beyond um, traditional search engines. 
Another uh, proposal that was made a few years ago, in 2006, by Ezio Ornato, um, as a reasonable utopia, um, but maybe too late, we should have thought of it before we em ever embarked on all of these projects, uh, was a Biblioteca Manuscripte Universalis, something like a Google Books of manuscripts, saying that uh, there are about, well, five to seven hundred thousand manuscripts, it's nothing compared to what Google is doing. Uh, among other problems that have been raised, uh, there is of course a great difference in the quality of photography necessary for Google Books and for manuscripts. And you can't turn the pages of manuscripts as brutally as Google tends to do it for books. Images also uh, pose specific problems as such, as a means of access to knowledge. We are not used to actually thinking with images. Images are always secondary in all these programs in relation to descriptions, which, also, which always come first. We need to uh, better integrate these two modes of knowledge. There is another session, as we know, um, that is going to deal specifically with the problems of uh, digitization, but especially from the point of view of heritage preservation. And this has always been the main traditional view of libraries and archives on what pictures are for in the first place. Uh, they are used as successors to the microfilm, um, and this also poses a number of intellectual or cognitive problems. Of course, in the uh, world of analogical photography, of microfilms, uh, things were clear enough. The microfilm was physically distinct from the original, but also distinct from the paper catalogue. And a microfilm needed no specific description beyond that which was available for the manuscripts for the original manuscripts. The libraries have tended, in the first place, to produce <coughs> digital images in the same set of mind as they previously um, produced their uh, microfilms. In the early years of the uh, digitization of manuscripts, we have had masses of sometimes mediocre pictures, often taken from existing surrogates, existing uh, microfilms, existing uh, slides, and many of these will actually have to be done over again, uh, which is a technical uh, problem, a problem of preservation, and a problem, of course, of money. Uh, as you might know, um, a portal such as JSTOR, which digitizes uh, periodicals, uh, plans to re-digitize them every five years as standards move forward. Can we afford to do anything like this for manuscripts? In a few cases, so on, on the one hand, we had these massive developments of uh, more or less uh, decent uh, photographs of manuscripts, of whole manuscripts, whole collections. And on the other hand, uh, at the opposite extreme, in a few cases, we have had, uh, even as early as the late 90s, uh, a few cases of single manuscripts, often illuminated manuscripts or uh, manuscripts with um, romance literature, with a far more detailed treatment. Uh, one famous example was the Aberdeen Bestiary. Uh, there have also been a number of projects uh, on the philological side, uh, digital editions with single page treatment and, uh, well, pictures and texts together, such as uh, the Charette project, the Chevalier de la Charette, uh, the Roman de la Rose, and so on, using XML, TI, and so on. The articulation of descriptions and images uh, is still problematic, mainly because search operations um, are mainly based on descriptions and they retrieve not directly manuscripts but catalogue entries and then from these you need to move on to see the images. Uh, you, do, you do not always know, you're not always told uh, when the results come up which of these manuscripts are actually illustrated. 
you don't know if you, well, in some cases yes, in others no. Uh, you often don't know uh, so how many illustrations you have, is the manuscript entirely uh, available or just a few sample pages. Um, in some cases this uh, is done using filters efficiently, uh, especially in the case of uh, Manuscripta Medievalia, the German portal. In other cases, such as the digitization of uh, the Spanish cultural heritage, you have to go down all sorts of steps before you actually know if you're going to get a picture or not. Uh, in other cases, such as the uh, Swiss e-codices, uh, that is not a problem because everything you have on the site is actually digitized. That's what the site is for. And so this is a constant problem. What do we actually have to work with? Uh, is it a digital library, such as e-codices, or is it a more or less illustrated catalogue? Two quite different things. Another problem which I find um, interesting and perplexing uh, is how virtual libraries relate and are going to relate with real world libraries now and in the future. Future research, it seems, uh, will be based more and more inevitably on surrogates, not on the original material. This is, of course, wonderfully convenient, but it also means that we're going to work mainly second-hand. Some confusion has been certainly created by libraries themselves, um, where digital images have often been considered as a new document, not, uh, well, uh, virtually separated from the original document. Uh, with its own reference number, and uh, for quite a long time on Gallica, once again, um, photographs of manuscripts were identified by the number of the photographs, but there was no means of getting to the manuscript by asking for the shelf, the shelf mark of the original manuscript. This has been solved now, luckily, fortunately. Uh, but it says something about how these documents uh, are considered by the people who produce them, by people who are in charge of IT uh, and other aspects of library management and not necessarily uh, under strict control from the people in charge of manuscripts. Another danger is, uh, of course, that digitized manuscripts might end being locked up uh, by librarians. On the other hand, non-digitized manuscripts are uh, in peril of being overlooked by researchers. This was always a problem um, in the world before the, uh, the internet. Manuscripts that were not catalogued got overlooked. Now, manuscripts that are not reproduced are going to be overlooked as well. We may also um, observe that reproductions are multiplying much faster than descriptions, as if, said before, um, there is no market anymore. The market is going down for uh, descriptions of manuscripts. Funding is going to be much easier, it's already much easier to find for reproduction than for description. And we might end up with more, more reproductions than useful descriptions. One solution that has been um, suggested is the solution of open catalogues, which brings us to the question of crowdsourcing. How efficient is that going to be? How reliable is that going to be? And are scholars going to be uh, willing to do this kind of um, free, are going to offer this kind of free labour and now that everything we do is being measured? Um, who is going to put work into anonymous descriptions of manuscripts on some website. There have been few projects of this kind. One you all know is uh, La Maratistiana di Rimini, uh, which was very interesting on the principle, but which seems to have raised little enthusiasm among colleagues for 
contributing free labour. At least one might say descriptions have now acquired a new function, which is reminding the viewer and the user that the image is not the real thing, that there is something beyond the two-dimensional photograph and what you actually see. The, um, since the description is based on the three-dimensional object. Between uh, descriptions and reproductions, I see the same kind of potential conflict that was described yesterday between, uh, as a conflict between books and indexes. You know, a book with an index is useless, a book without, a u without an index is useless. Uh, if we go straight to single images identified through indexes or search engines, uh, then we are losing something important, which is browsing, leafing through books and, I would say, even more archives. This is a problem probably even more for archives than for books. When you are able to go straight to one single document, you're losing sight of uh, contextual information. And this is something which is coming up very fast. I'll say just a few words about archives, and just wait a uh, how, how much time is there left? I have another five minutes. Yeah. Yeah. One thirty. There's plenty of time. I'm almost through. Uh, right. I have not said much about archives uh, because there is actually not very much one can say, at least on uh, existing tools. Archives have shown a scarce interest in material aspects. The uh, research, as we know, in archives is done using specific procedures uh, following a structural institutional logic, uh, even, well, more consistently than going through, uh, through indexes and straight from an index to a document. And finding aids traditionally give very little information about material aspects. Historians are not very much interested in them. Um, and this has been, this has long been a problem, among others, for paleographers who need to go straight to the original to see what the script looks like because the uh, inventory will never tell them. Um, this is also a problem for, for those few historians that have recently become interested in the code ecology of archives on questions such as um, the use of paper in archives, say, in the 13th or 14th centuries. Another uh, issue that has scarcely uh, interested uh, archives is uh, the question of interoperability. Archives tend to be managed on a local level, local politics, local public, local history. Um, this can also be explained um, on the reason that archives tend to travel much less than books. To bring your material together, you don't need to go through much, so, so much scattered materials when you're working on uh, a literary tradition. In France, it is even um, often difficult to get to the website of an archive. You have to go through the website of some weird institution, you know, the Direction des Affaires Culturelles of some département, before you, you actually find the right door to go into the archive. Uh, another problem is that medieval records are relatively unimportant to local politics, the local public, which is mainly um, made of genealogists, and so uh, the uh, digitization of medieval material has not really taken off on the internet. There is some, but in a few places. What we do have for archives are uh, descriptive standards based on XML format, uh, encoded archival description EAD. What we do not have, uh, to the best of my knowledge, is uh, anything like real networks, a network of archive or a gateway, a convenient gateway to archives or common databases. In Italy we have some of the most impressive um, local programs, especially in Florence, but we also have one of the most, I think the most important common gateway which you might know, which is l'archivio storico multimediale del Medioevo, uh, no, del Mediterraneo, scusate. Um, 
which was developed by the Archivio di Stato di Catania, and which is very impressive, not only in quantity of material gathered from various sources, hundreds of thousands of documents, but also in its uh, technical sophistication. A very sophisticated search engine using ontologies and um, methods unheard of in most similar sites. So archives, on the whole, are still mainly aimed at local history and make it rather difficult for anyone interested in global history. You have to go from one side to the other and see what you can find, just as you would have walked from one, or driven from one archive to the next in uh, real world documents. So to conclude, um, I think we need to ask the question, what do we expect from paleography, code ecology, how important are material aspects to us? Is the description of manuscripts as objects secondary? Could it be subordinate to philology? One might even ask uh, sometimes, is it, might it be a gratuitous show of scholarly technique, which nobody actually really needs, or few people need? Or are uh, material aspects still a historical issue in its own right? For what? They can tell us about medieval technology, economy, society, culture, and so on. The, uh, th this problem, of course, goes well beyond manuscript. The, the uh, fundamental problem is the critical situation of quantitative methods in general. So I've asked a number of questions, all of which I cannot answer. I would just end, uh, like to end with a couple of suggestions regarding precisely the use of images as a means of uh, learning and of knowing more about manuscripts. Uh, the, question, the, the main question I, was, I would like to ask is about images and search engines. Images as output and images as input. As I have said, search engines deliver descriptions, not directly images. The images are always one click further away. Uh, I believe that direct visual browsing of whole libraries or of the results of a search might bring us closer to real, to what would be the real world browsing of books on a shelf, which is something we're not accustomed to because that is something librarians can do, but you can't do uh, that kind of work when you walk into a library as a reader. And so we maybe we don't think of that kind of that, that way in which we can access the information directly through visual means instead, through, instead of going in through the uh, constant mediation of descriptions. So that is images as output, which technically should be no problem. Um, what is much more complicated but might be interesting is images as input. How can we query a corpus using images directly. This is more complex. Some of you might know about things like Google Advanced Image Search. You copy an image into your browser and Google will give you similar images. It doesn't always work very well. You input a red tricycle, you get a red bus as a result. Um, but that kind of work, uh, I think, is possible Maybe not. Maybe it won't be very efficient in the near future, but in the longer term, I think this is something that has great potential. This is something that uh, there have been a number of programs on, um, especially by uh, the Institut de Recherche d'Histoire des Textes, uh, working together with IT specialists. There was a program a few years ago called Forms et Couleurs, which aimed at retrieving uh, images similar in layout, color and so on, and more recently by uh, the IRHT once again, L'Ecole des Chartes and uh, the same IT specialists, uh, this was the Graphem project, um, which aims, it's not quite efficient yet, but it aims at retrieving scripts according to similarity. So these are just two suggestions, I'm sure we don't get many more uh, between today and tomorrow. Thank you.
condition. But if you know what, how many difficulties, mm. uh, because of the federalism, <laughs> <laughs> that probably, uh, probably it is a good way. And it is also what we said in another sense here, step by step. Uh, these are problems who have been to attack step by step. It cannot be a global uh, solution and so on. Um, in another, in another sense, it is the same. Ecologists began with one library and then another with enormous difficulties with Swiss libraries, no help uh, by federal institutions uh, as the Swiss National Foundation or, and so on. Uh, <coughs> and uh, Christoph Rüder and the members of the committee, as myself, would like to have a centralized. <laughs> uh, Governments uh, in that, uh, for that uh, project. Uh, but uh, uh, if one step is realized, this step uh, stands. Mm -hmm. And then we can build up. And this is Switzerland. Um, so the discussion is open to, to uh, the floor for all uh, these uh, kind of, of, also of new problems. You know, it's a reality that we, as a librarian, in everyday uh, work, uh, we are, mm, the librarians are decreasing, you know, just, uh, yes. yeah, I think in Italy, maybe this uh, was an international problem, and uh, uh, just I would like to connect with the other uh, need to cooperate between librarians and scholars that yes. was made before. And uh, maybe this is uh, the right direction uh, and uh, the, mm, we had experience with Malatistiana, but I think that this could be the future. Uh, yeah, because with the, if the librarians are decreasing, the, specializ the specialization required for, to handle manuscripts are uh, increasing. And uh, it's uh, impossible, maybe in the future, to have a librarian who is a specialist together in medieval manuscripts, in oriental manuscripts, so, and so <clears throat> So one of the, uh, of the um, uh, maybe our solution is just try to, to get a sort of uh, uh, collaborative cataloging or crowdsourcing. And I know there, is a, there are other experiences also, they need for a special sector like uh, this is my experience with Islamic manuscripts at Michigan University. Me, this uh, experience of uh, collaborative cataloging, and this was not so, you know. Of course, it needs to uh, mm, to have maybe it needs a step behind from librarians. Uh, uh, mm, uh, you, n you don't have to uh, imagine a. a, a sort of cataloging like we are accustomed to do. Uh, maybe it's something different. But this is, I think, this is the only way to have the data necessary for database. Uh, well, I could say that uh, would be impossible at present being for us, for the parents working uh, in Italy, but I don't say to introduce other data in the everyday work we have to do, you have to do uh, catalog, uh, cataloging, we have to do front office, we have to do uh, other work, so, so there is uh, uh, no possibility to have the uh, cataloger like uh, maybe 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Uh, we have to change our role and uh, have a sort of uh, uh, task of intermediary between uh, users, scholars or users in general, and objects, manuscripts, or, or documentation information. So this, uh, uh, this, um, uh, this sort of cooperative Italian could be, 
I don't think this is the solution, but a very good contribution to have more data to have uh, to um, to share among the, the, the scholars. So I think that this is a one point, maybe it's a minor point, but uh, uh, for people like us, for reverence is very very important. And it is an important point, <clears throat> but in a recent article, uh, in a follow-up to his 2006 article on the Biblioteca Manuscripta Universalis, uh, Ezio Ornato uh, suggested that librarians could contribute skeletal descriptions of the images that are being put online, uh, containing essentially all the information that cannot be gathered from the images, and then let people outside uh, contribute to the description based on what they can see on their screens, which is theoretically one possibility. The main difficulty, uh, difficulty as I said before, is that professional researchers now are being assessed all the time and asking what they're doing and how many things they have signed and so on. And so it's mainly a, a sociological problem of how much labour uh, researchers are going to put into this kind of thing. Um, there have been instances uh, in which that kind of concept has worked out very well, and this is actually in archives, working not with professional researchers, but with fans of genealogy, you know, putting up on the internet registers with lists of names, and these people were reading out the names and typing them in uh, hundred by hundreds uh, every hour. This has worked out very well in a couple of uh, archives in France, but uh, more and more tend to think amateur researchers uh, are becoming more productive than professionals because they, <laughs> because they are free to do as they like, you know, and use their time as they like. So this comes to the, the topic of uh, interoperability with the public, mm. the 2.0 applications. Yes, right. And then, uh, no, this has been last discussed, this matter has been discussed a lot in, uh, by German librarians. And the question is, is very, the answer is very ambiguous. On the one hand, support by the public is welcome for the cataloging of library materials. On the other hand, there should be some room to control it. There should be some to check out whether it is valuable, the, cont the contribution of the public. And there it is, um, well, resources are very limited, that's one. Second is, there is for Manuscript of Medievali, there is a, a button which you can put, which you can push, or which you can write an addition or a correction to existing descriptions of manuscripts. Yes. But this possibility is very, very used. Mm. It's and used also in Gallica. There's also a function. You can also press a button saying, I think there's something wrong in this description. So we sometimes get such uh, reactions, but very few. Mm. So in that sense, the community of the public of archives is different from the community of the public of libraries. Oh, yes, definitely. definitely. Um, regarding the, um, the variety of descriptions, maybe it would be a very good idea to give up the idea that there is only one valid description of an object. Um, in Europeana, we have discussed this at length, and um, the data model we've put in place allows for several concurrent descriptions of a given item um, using the so-called proxy mechanism. Um, and you need that when you have different communities at work that have completely different views of what an object actually is. Uh, take the librarians, for instance. When they describe books, they describe physical attributes at length, and then they may add a keyword, a, a index term, a classification thing, but that's about 5% of their description. Uh, they do not deal with content, Neither do they deal, by the way, with what you are proposing with context. They just uh, describe physical attributes. And then you have other people, like, for instance, from the archival communities, which are not object-driven at all. For them, an object only exists as part of an event of a process. Um, and you absolutely need to allow for a variety of 
concurrent restrictions present on one given object. And if we give up that idea of the unique description, I think we get much further. Well, that brings us once again to the different conceptions of uh, databases by institutions, by uh, cultural heritage institutions, uh, databases for researchers, and so on. In what measure can we bring them together? Mm. We as database or description. Right. I don't want to stress the point I tried to uh, to present before, but uh, I think uh, Professor Gradman is uh, right when he said that uh, the problem is if you are using an entity relation model, you you need to have a real, a, a valid, uh, an author, an authoritative description because it's very hard to have concurrent descriptions in an entity relation model. If you shift in a semantic web uh, model, you have, I don't think that the uh, concurrent term is uh, so, um, uh, has to be used. I prefer to use uh, another way of presenting the, the issue. You have, not concurrent, but some kind of layers that could be overlapped the one over the other to have a much more complete uh, representation of the object you are seeing. Because there are no objects but representations of the objects, of the different aspects of the objects. So, in a database, all this stuff is very hard to implement. We need to shift to another model of uh, data re representation, and I think this is the, 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 the issue of the following years for our community. Thank you.